Good morning. This is Dr. Lahudrami. Um, I'm a pediatric cardiologist and a cardiac intensivist, and I um, will be talking about acquired heart disease. This is a vast topic. Um, uh, um, the objectives of today's talk, um, we will be discussing um, uh, some of the causes of acquired heart disease, um, including Kawasaki, acute myocarditis, or infective endocarditis. We will not be, uh, we will not have time to talk about rheumatic heart disease or uh, pericarditis. Um, I'll start with a case. Uh, so this is a recent case I took care of. He's a um, 23 month young male um, uh, who presented with a, um, a uh, two and a half weeks of high fever. Uh, the fever was unremittent, up to 103 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, that improved with uh, acetaminophen, then uh, the use of um, ibuprofen. One day after uh, he started with a high fever, he started having a body rash that was transient then that um, a, um, a went over um, all of his body um, and um, he, he developed conjunct conjunctival erythema without discharge, was very irritable and clingy to his mother and was only breastfeeding um, but did not eat solid food and he was still peeing. Um, he presented um, uh, to um, to the infectious disease person, uh, 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 clinician uh, after his PCP had seen him at the beginning of the illness and was checking on the patient by phone. Um, uh, he um, his irritability persisted. Uh, he had dry lips and and peeling of the toes. Um, so uh, um, the, when the infectious disease specialist uh, saw him, he um, asked for a, um, a, um, a, a an urgent evaluation with uh, pediatric cardiology. Uh, and when we saw him, he was he was dynamically stable and afebrile. Um, however, he had mild periorbital swelling, um, conjunctival injection, sparing the limbus no cervical lymphadenopathies, a quiet precordium with a normal uh, cardiac exam without any gallop or rubs or murmurs, and he had indeed peeling of the toes. Um, and, um, his capillary flow is normal, and he had no joint swelling. Um, we um, uh, highly suspected um, Kawasaki disease, and we did an echocardiogram that showed involvement of the coronaries. Um, especially dilation of the right coronary artery with um, a distal saccular aneurysm and aneurysm of the left main coronary artery. So what is Kawasaki disease? It is an acute self-limited systemic vasculitis. Um, um, it is um, a, at this day and age in the developed countries, uh, it's a leading cause of acquired heart disease. It usually affects infants and young children. However, it has been described in adolescents and usually it's a misdiagnosis um, that uh, presents with complications. It was first diagnosed by Dr. Kawasaki in Japan, um, but it has an endemic uh, an epidemic um, uh, incidence. Um, the, um, it is common in the winter and early spring. Um, boys are more affected than girls, and most of the um, uh, patients uh, present before the age of five years. The etiology is very, uh, very um, um, unclear. Um, uh, we know that those patients uh, who develop Kawasaki disease have genetic polymorphisms um, that predispose them to react to a super antigen. Um, uh, um, those uh, super antigenic toxins come from staph or strep or other viruses. Um, there is the um, immunologic response that causes this systemic vasculitis. Um, and we know that there is some infectious cause because um, it comes in, in epidemics. Um, um, the, the principal clinical findings in Kawasaki disease is the fever um, that is elevated and persistent more than five days. It usually responds poorly to NSAIDs or antibiotics. And you have to have four out of five of the following. Um, uh, bilateral non-purulent conjunctivitis it spares the limbus because this part is non-vascularized. Uh, some people call it the devil's eyes. Um, um, you have um, a, a 
um, a mucous uh, membrane involvement with strawberry tongue and loss of the papilla of the tongue. Um, uh, you can have erythema of, uh, of the lips and cracking of the lips um, uh, or erythema of the pharynx. Um, uh, the changes in extremities mostly are swelling of the hands and feet uh, and pul pulmonary and solar or erythema. Um, um, two weeks after the illness, uh, we start seeing uh, peeling of the hands and feet, and uh, we have a polymorphic, uh, polymorphous exantum uh, or a rash. Uh, usually, it's every kind. It can be anywhere from a, um, a macular rash to a target lesions, except um, vesicular. Uh, we have lymph nodes, and usually it's um, it's it's a a, um, a an agglomeration of multiple lymph nodes that make it um, that that might feel as one uh, lymph node. Um, the cardiac involvement usually all of those patients have myocarditis. It is universal. Uh, they can present with um, uh, no symptoms or symptoms of congestive heart failure, pericarditis, uh, uh, valva regurgitation, um, but most importantly, worry about the coronary artery abnormalities, and I'll speak about that um, in a few slides. Um, the ectasia, or dilation of the coronary artery uh, to, to form an aneurysm, usually develop in 15 to 25 percent of untreated children with the disease, and may lead, may, may lead to myocardial infarction, sudden death, or ischemic heart. Um, uh, other systems in the body are involved. Uh, you can have vascular constriction that leads to Raynaud's phenomenon or peripheral gangrene. Um, they can have arthritis or arthralgia. They can have uh, gastrointestinal symptoms like high drops of the gallbladder, hepatic dysfunction, uh, diarrhea, vomiting, or abdominal pain. They are very irritable due to aseptic meningitis. In one out of five kids have a, a, a sensory neural loss um, that can lead to deafness. Um, they can have urethritis or meatitis, uh, anterior uveitis, and uh, disclamation rash in the groin. Um, ancillary data will help make the diagnosis, and those uh, include leukocytosis with neutrophilia, elevated inflammatory markers, anemia, abnormal, uh, abnormal plasma lipids, uh, elevated LSTs, and high gamma GT, uh, low albumin, and low sodium, as well as sterile pyuria and pleocytosis of the CSF. In those patients, we suspect meningitis. Uh, they might uh, come with uh, leukocytosis and synovial fluid and thrombocytosis. The, um, the, the finding on it, or the clinical manifestation um, of a Kawasaki disease um, are actually uh, um, a, a time dependent. So initially we have the fever. Um, you can have the arthritis and myocarditis later. Um, the skin manifestation come in waves. You can have um, uh, red and palm soles in the first one to two weeks, and then the squamation comes later. And then later, after two months, you can have nail uh, changes. Um, uh, and thrombocytosis um, uh, will, uh, is a later finding. Uh, we can make the diagnosis of Kawasaki disease if we have fever and more than four principal criteria um, uh, on day four of the illness. We don't have to uh, wait for day five. Um, and if we do have coronary artery abnormalities, we can make the diagnosis even if we have less um, than four principal criteria. Um, now, if we suspect a Kawasaki disease but it's incomplete, we rely on ancillary testing and we rely on the echocardiogram to help make the diagnosis. And we keep um, checking and checking. And uh, in this endorsed clinical report um, uh, that was published in circulation of 2004, um, this actually is helpful in, in, in uh, making the diagnosis. Um, the goal, goals of uh, therapy in the acute phase of Kawasaki disease is to actually reduce the systemic and coronary arteritis and to help with the plate, platelet uh, aggregation so we can avoid arterial thrombosis and myocardial infarction. Um, 
Usually, the treatment is with intravenous gamma globulin at a dose of 2 grams per kilo uh, over time. Um, uh, we have to be careful when we're giving this because it's, um, it's a high solute load. It's equivalent to giving 40 milliliter per kilo of, of crystalloids. And in someone who has myocarditis, they might not, be, uh, they might not tolerate this much of, of solute load and they can have pulmonary edema. Um, we also use um, high-dose aspirin. Um, for um, uh, to to help with a systemic inflammation, and we use it for uh, 48 to 72 hours after the fever um, uh, is gone. Then we switch to low dose aspirin at three to five milligram per kilo uh, daily for six to eight weeks. Um, Fifteen percent of children who have Kawasaki disease have persistent fever, and this is defined as a temperature that is uh, continues to be elevated 36 hours after IVIG. Um, IV gamma globulin can cause fever, so uh, any temperature that um, uh, actually we're very careful with any temperature that um, uh, occurs after IVIG. We think that it might be a side effect of IV gamma globulin, uh, but we uh, also rely on repeating blood work and inflammatory markers to see if they indeed are coming down or not. Um, if we think that those patients have persistent fever and, vascu and ongoing vasculitis, um, the standard practice is to retreat if the patient has persistent uh, fever with another dose of 2 gram per kilo. Now, if someone is very resistant to IVIG, now the treatment becomes very controversial, and we rely on on, um, on a published uh, some unpublished data, talking to Kawasaki experts. Um, usually, we uh, we can repeat IVIG. Uh, we usually try st corticosteroids, um, either pulsed and then long term. Uh, we can try uh, TNF alpha blockers, um, cyclosporins, uh, cyclosporin. Um, interleukin receptor antagonist or methotrexate. Um, the risk factors for coronary artery aneurysms are uh, usually a male gender, uh, a young age, less than six months. Uh, usually those patients present with incomplete Kawasaki disease, or if we have an older uh, children uh, more than five years, typically those are missed. Um, if, they ha if those patients do have persistent fever despite IV gamma globulin, and we know that there is severe ongoing vasculitis if they present with um, low hematocrit, low platelets, low albumin, high CRP, more than 10 milligram per liter, and a higher absolute band count or low sodium. The natural history of coronary artery aneurysms are um, usually the dilation starts uh, appearing at um, or above the day seven of the illness. Um, the peak vessel diameter is reached at one month after the illness onset, and um, usually in more than 50% of the cases, they regress within one to two years. The pathology of coronary vasculitis is uh, such that um, there is um, severe inflammation that causes the media of the vessel to, to be swollen, and um, there is dissociation of the smooth muscle cells um, that is obvious to the exterior. The endothelial cells swelling um, and uh, subendothelial edema that ensues um, uh, are, are um, there. Um, the internal elastic lamina is intact initially, however, um, um, uh, the, uh, because of the inflammation, there is influx of neutrophils, lymphocytes, and plasma cells within the uh, day seven to nine of the disease that um, destroy this elastic uh, lamina. Um, the body attempts to repair um, uh, those endothelial cells by replacing them with fibroblasts. So this, this causes progressive fibrosis and scar formation. Um, there's also active remodeling um, uh, uh, in the endothelium that causes intimal proliferation um, and formation of new vessels. And this results in the stenosis of the coronary artery. Um, um, usually, uh, the coronary artery involvement is mostly at the left anterior descending. The second uh, uh, common site is the right coronary artery, and then the left circumflex and, and the left main. 
Um, a, this is a, um, a, a, an angio CT scan of a, a patient with a coronary uh, with Kawasaki disease, and um, this is the right coronary artery with an aneurysm um, at the proximal right coronary artery. There is um, near obliteration um, distally of, of this, this vessel. It's very, very stenosed. Uh, there are aneurysms also involving the left anterior descending and the uh, proximal left circumflex artery. Um, this is a picture of an aneurysm um, uh, um, uh, seen uh, on the surface of the heart during uh, open heart surgery. Um, the um, antithrombotic therapy uh, for those patients include aspirin. If we have moderate um, um, aneurysms, meaning more than three millimeters, um, we use Plavix as antiplatelet therapy. Um, if we have a giant aneurysm, meaning more than five millimeters, um, uh, typically we can use a heparin uh, or a warfarin. Um, uh, the um, newer oral uh, direct thrombin or factor 10A inhibitors are not approved in children yet. Um, this is a study um, uh, from uh, Japan in 1985 showing that uh, patients who presented with Kawasaki disease had myocardial infarction within the first two years of, of uh, after their illness. Um, so, um, uh, if we ha if we do have thrombosis, uh, we do thrombolytic therapy. We can um, uh, treat uh, with platelet glycoprotein two uh, B three A receptor antagonist, and we uh, take them to the cath lab for coronary intervention. Um, most of our patients who um, present have uh, either uh, normal coronaries or very mild uh, dilation if they are treated. And we know that those patients have abnormal lipid metabolism. They have decreased myocardial blood flow and coronary flow um, uh, with adenosine. And they have a, an abnormal reactivity of their coronaries as they grow older. Other data suggest that um, they, they do well. So there are ongoing studies, um, and what we do for, for patients who present with Kawasaki disease is we focus on early prevention, meaning um, uh, we, we ask the parents to, to really work hard in not letting them smoke. We screen for hyperlipidemia. We treat hypertension and diabetes very early, and um, we try to make them um, have a healthy lifestyle and, and, and prevent obesity in them. Um, and we uh, follow them according to um, a, a long-term follow-up um, protocol. And um, this is actually in, um, printed in that consensus I mentioned earlier. Um, if we have normal coronaries, for instance, we follow them every few years after the first year, and um, we just do preventive measurements. If we do have giant coronary aneurysm, we, we, we restrict their activities and we do stress testing and cardiac catheterization and, and cardiac CT very uh, frequently. In summary, um, I want to leave you with um, having a very high index of suspicion if a child presents with fever more than seven days, uh, even if they are young, um, for Kawasaki disease. Um, coronary aneurysm form as early as uh, seven days, and IVIG decreases the formation of those aneurysms. So as a follow-up for on our case, um, this patient, even though he presented a um, few days after he defervest, he had ongoing vasculitis, and we indeed admitted him, treated him with IVIG, and his coronary artery uh, aneurysms have decreased slightly in size. Uh, he remains on Plavix and aspirin uh, for now, and, and uh, we hope that he um, does not develop any coronary artery stenosis. Um, the case, uh, the second case I wanted to talk about, and I'll, uh, this is a, a case I took care of. Um, a, um, a, she's an 18-month young um, a, a child who presented um, to an outside hospital with two-day history of increased work of breathing, um, with no wheezing, and, and her PCP um, a diagnosed bronchiolitis. Uh, he prescribed albuterol, which helped a little bit, but um, she had no fever, no retractions. And um, her vitals, when she presented to the pediatric ward, had um, elevated heart rate um, with um, a, um, tachypnea. 
Um, when she arrived to the pediatric ward, uh, she lost her peripheral IV and then and was noted to be very listless, uh, gray grunting with no movement and insertion uh, with insertion of a new peripheral IV. Uh, for this reason, uh, she was intubated on the ward and transferred to the PICU for for um, a, for a shock. Um, initially, um, she was transferred at 3 in the morning uh, with a heart rate of 162, um, and no, no uh, temperature, with a blood pressure of 76 over 58. Um, for her age, this is low blood pressure and, um, and delayed capillary fill. Her ET tube had bloody secretions. Initially, her x-ray showed um, some, uh, somewhat cardiomegaly. There's some left lower lobe atelectasis, and her pulmonary uh, and her lung fields were wet. Um, it suggests of a pulmonary edema. Um, ten hours later, um, uh, she, when she was being turned to her side, she, um, uh, she, um, uh, uh, she became suddenly bradycardic with acute desaturation, and they, uh, she lost her pulse. So um, uh, CPR was uh, uh, initiated according to the PULSE protocol, an uh, intraosseous line was placed, and um, she received um, uh, epinephrine, atropine, and uh, the initial gas showed metabolic acidosis. Uh, throughout the code, she, um, she received epinephrine, bicarb, and calcium. Um, at the end of 45 minutes to one hour, she uh, maintained, uh, she consistently, uh, consistently maintained a palpable femoral pulse, and um, the cardiologist was called. Um, her ECG showed nonspecific signs. Um, the heart rate was a little bit elevated, but she had just uh, negative T waves um, all over. Um, uh, but her echocardiogram showed severe left ventricular dilation. This is a left ventricle, um, aorta, mitral valve, and left atrium. And, and the left ventricle was really like a balloon. It was not really squeezing but rocking. Um, the right ventricle was uh, decreased, and there was no effusion. And the echocardiogram ruled out um, other structural heart disease. Um, she um, was started on inotropic support. Um, her repeat echocardiogram um, on inotropic support showed some improvement, and she was placed on ECMO uh, for the uh, diagnosis of acute myocarditis. So by definition, acute myocarditis um, is an inflammation of the myocardium in association with myocellular necrosis. Um, and the um, etiology of myocarditis is mostly viral in children. Um, and most common viruses are um, enteroviruses, such as Coxsackie virus A and B, echo, um, and um, adenovirus, um, a parvovirus B19, and we're seeing most uh, recently influenza, as well as EBV uh, and RSV. Um, in the New England area, we won't forget about Lyme disease, but there are other parasites that can cause a, um, a myo acute myocarditis. Uh, as we grow older um, uh, or in older children, we can have a uh, reaction to medications or eosinophilic um, a myocarditis, hypersensitivity. It can be associated with collagen vascular diseases such as lupus um, or um, a mixed connective tissue disease. And I um, previously mentioned Kawasaki. When we don't find a cause, we call it idiopathic. Um, it's, it's roughly an underdiagnosed under um, disorder. Um, in a large multicenter myocarditis trial, the incidence of acute myocarditis was uh, up to 9%. Um, uh, however, um, uh, um, using the Dallas criteria, which I'll talk about uh, later, uh, the WHO thought that the incidence of acute myocarditis is 1%. And if you use the um, Coxsackie virus uh, myocarditis, it usually increases to 4%. However, um, it is seen in, in, um, a, a, in young men uh, who, who, had, who are trauma victims and uh, had uh, evidence of, of um, healed um, myocarditis. 
um, it is the cause of uh, um, in, um, of dilated cardiomyopathy in 3 to 63 uh, percent in adults. And the mean age of diagnosis is nine uh, years with bimodal distribution um, between the age of six to 12 months um, or uh, adolescence. It can be sporadic, but it, it can occur as an epidemic. Um, it, we can see it uh, in newborns, and usually those um, have um, a poor uh, survival. Usually the survival is 35%. Um, typically it's Coxsackie virus B. Um, it, it can be uh, transmitted uh, uh, in utero or, or postnatally. Uh, the pathogenesis is very, is interesting because the virus destroys the muscle um, and uh, exposes the, myosa the the antigens to to the immune um, um, uh, 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 to the innate immune response. Um, we don't know why uh, some patients have um, a, this this response, but um, the, the the virus, the protein, the toxin can trigger this innate immune response, and there's some upregulation of of receptors on the macrophages that lead to really a lot of interleukin and cytokine release. Um, there's also downregulation of some of the um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, lymphocyte T who um, do not help with this immune response. Um, there's a lot of exposure to antigen. Those antigens are uh, um, um, presented uh, as uh, to, to macrophages and T cells, and um, the, the immune response that is acquired actually helps with the destruction of, of, the, of the heart. Um, uh, uh, this leads to either ongoing injury or recovery with some persistent cardiomyopathy. Um, in the pathophysiology, because of this viral infection and extensive inflammation, there's decreased myocardial contractility. The heart enlarges. The left ventricular and diastolic pressure increases. The cardiac output decreases. Because of this decrease um, and because cardiac output equals stroke volume times um, heart rate, um, there's increased sympathetic tone that increases the heart rate to preserve the blood pressure. So um, this, uh, there's sinus tachycardia that actually make the injury worse and causes congestive heart failure. The progressive increase in LVEDP causes high LA pressure. Um, this, this causes increased pulmonary venous pressure um, and, um, and, and contributes to the pulmonary edema seen in those patients. Um, the heart tries to the, the body or the, immune, uh, the, uh, the body tries to heal the heart, but uh, instead of myocytes, there's a replacement by fibroblasts. So uh, you have some scarring. The scarring can cause ventricular tachycardia and complete AV block. Um, patients with acute myocarditis uh, present in, in variable um, uh, clinical scenarios. Neonates have very nonspecific features. They have fever or no fever. They uh, feed poorly because exercise uh, uh, feeding is like exercise for them. They can be listless uh, or uh, appear septic. Um, in children or adolescents, they typically have a recent history of vital illness because in most of the cases, um, acute myocarditis is vital in origin. Um, they can uh, present with nonspecific uh, gastrointestinal sympt uh, symptoms or tachypnea. Chest pain is less common, uh, but it can be fulminant in, in, in presentation. And uh, later in the course, they can um, uh, present with syncope or death. Um, usually tachycardia is present, and, uh, but signs of heart failure can be absent. We coined the term of fulminant myocarditis um, to severe left ventricular dysfunction and shock. Some centers report that um, up to 10% of patients presenting with acute myocarditis have this fulminant form. Um, on physical exam, they have res increased respiratory work. Um, they have signs of low cardiac output with um, a tachycardia. They have a gallop rhythm, either S3 or S4. They have cardiomegaly on exam. Uh, they have poor extremity perfusion, oliguria. They, ha they gain so much weight. And briefly, they are ill-appearing, dusky, and gray, as if they're going to arrest um, in front of you.
The chest X-ray shows cardiomegaly in 60% in of the cases. This is an X-ray of, um, um, of the 18-month-old um, with fulminant myocarditis who um, has, whose heart size is not really very um, increased, although he had pulmonary edema. And this is a, a case of a 14-year young um, adolescent who presented with fulminant myocarditis, um, had to be supported with ECMO in the ER. Um, and uh, her heart size is perfectly normal. Um, most of patients have uh, EKG abnormalities, um, uh, but the, the, those signs on the ECG are very non, non uh, um, uh, very. I'm sorry, um, they're they're present, but non non sensitive or specific for acute myocarditis. Typically, there's ST segment flattening or T wave inversion. Um, there's low QRS voltages. Um, you can have any arrhythmias like uh, atrial ectopic tachycardia, uh, flutter or SVT, or ventricular tachycardia. A few examples, uh, this is an ECG on the 14-year-old um, I just mentioned, showing tachycardia, sinus tachycardia with very small voltages all over and minimal ST elevation. This is another patient presented with very elevated troponin and chest pain. And um, you have the um, pathologic ST elevation in um, inferior and lateral leads. Um, this is a, a, re, a marked ST elevation um, that is severely abnormal. Um, one patient presented with ventricular tachycardia and um, torsad, another patient presented with um, a complete AV block where um, this is the atrial rate and the, vent, the junctional rate is, is, is um, uh, slower, much slower. Um, the, there are elevation. There is elevation of the biomarkers in myocarditis. Um, uh, typically, we rely on a troponin T that is more specific. Um, troponin I is very uh, has a very light, low sensitivity. Um, high ASTs can be elevated, um, and we use uh, sometimes uh, uh, brain natriuretic peptide or proBNP to to help differentiate between in, uh, between heart failure and um, and lung disease. Um, the echocardiogram uh, is always abnormal, and um, a, a, a we look for. Um, uh, structural abnormalities that can give us the same diagnosis. This is an apical view of the heart where this is the left ventricle, it's severely dilated. This is the right ventricle that is squished and uh, this will uh, tell us uh, how bad is the function, how bad is the valve regurgitation, is there any um, 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 pericardial effusion and will help make uh, the differential diagnosis. Um, in the um, large multicenter myocarditis uh, treatment trial that I mentioned earlier, um, uh, they noticed that um, in a acute active myocarditis, the LV is, 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 is ballooned and the LV volume is large. Uh, for fulminant myocarditis, the LV is smaller in cavity and it's more thick. And if there's loss of right ventricular function, um, this is the most powerful predictor of death and the need for cardiac transplantation. Um, we also use MRI to help make the diagnosis. Um, uh, uh, as you all know, um, this uh, usually uh, is done uh, when the patient is stable. Uh, we take them to the MRI scan and we inject gadolinium. The, um, uh, um, when we inject the uh, gadolinium areas that are uh, normally enhancing, uh, I'm sorry, um, perfusion defect will, will appear as dark. Um, and then if we wait for eight to 10 minutes later and we repeat the, the pictures, uh, we see that there are some hyper intense areas just like this here um, that uh, um, uh, uh, where there is necrosis or scarring or fibrosis or an infection because those cells retain the contrast agent longer than the healthy myocardium. This can be used to make the diagnosis and can, can be used as well to help guide um, the uh, interventional cardiologist to biopsy those lesions if we really want to make sure there is um, um, acute infection. 
Uh, we can use also radionuclide imaging. Um, I will mention the cath and endomyocardial biopsy. This is done, this used to be done in, on every patient who presented uh, with myocarditis in big um, hospitals. Um, however, it has um, its own set of, of limitations. Um, typically, um, a, um, using a bioptome, um, a, um, a, a small chunks of the, of the uh, myocardium are taken from the right uh, ventricle. So as you can see, um, if you take few biopsies and you are missing those um, uh, inflammation that are patchy, um, you can uh, miss the diagnosis. Uh, what we look for is um, a infiltration of, of the um, uh, of, of the myocytes um, uh, by uh, lymphocytes and histiocytes, as well as necrosis of of the um, uh, uh, of the of the myocytes. We use the Dallas criteria to, to make those diagnoses. However, um, and usually uh, a specimen can be classified as active myocarditis, borderline myocarditis, or, or no myocarditis. However, uh, some, uh, in some uh, uh, centers, this ha had um, been abandoned because um, this is a histopathological categorization. And um, in, in some studies, if you only take one biopsy post-mortem, um, you can only demonstrate myocarditis in 25% of the samples. If you take five biopsies, you only demonstrate myocarditis in two-thirds of the cases. And to really identify 80% of the cases, you have to take 17 specimens, which is really unreasonable. Um, we, uh, if we end up taking um, uh, tissues and endomyocardial biopsy, we can do tissue PCR, but we also can do vital studies uh, on the blood that can help, um, and uh, we use PCR, uh, for instance. Um, what I want you to uh, be um, aware of is the differential diagnosis of acute myocarditis in a newborn or infant. Um, any uh, newborn with sepsis can have uh, cardiac dysfunction um, uh, if they have hypoxemia, hypoglycemia, or hypocalcemia. Um, we always want to rule out anomalous coronary artery origin or decreased perfusion to the heart. Um, in an older child, uh, the, different, the main differential diagnosis is dilated cardiomyopathy, either um, idiopathic, X-linked, or autosomal dominant. An almost left coronary artery from the pulmonary artery or alcapa is still on the differential, but we really want to make sure those patients did not have chronic tachyarrhythmias that caused uh, uh, arrhythmia-induced cardiomyopathy um, or um, um, uh, on the long run. The prognosis is, is kind of favorable in, in um, uh, children as compared to adults. 90% uh, will survive, 10% will die. However, of those um, uh, patients who survive, uh, not all of them will recover fully. They might have dilated cardiomyopathy and might need to be transplanted. Um, I, I um, exclude the, uh, the neonatal myocarditis from this, um, this slide because neonatal myocarditis is very progressive and the survival is, is um, only 35%. The treatment of acute myocarditis depends on the severity of myocardial involvement. Um, no therapy has been proven to be effective. Um, uh, we usually treat mild disease with uh, close monitoring, um, restriction of activity, especially in the first six months, uh, and, and really uh, helping the, this patient heal. Um, we treat uh, congestive heart failure uh, symptoms with diuretics, uh, ACE inhibitors, um, and anticoagulation if need be. The fulminant cases who present with shock, we, we support them with inotropic support, inodilators, um, and we use IVIG. Um, a, um, the use of IV gamma globulin uh, is based on the study um, in, uh, in Boston Children's where they um, took uh, 21 patients with acute myocarditis. Uh, most of them were uh, endomyocardial biopsy uh, proven myocarditis. And they used IVIG and compared them to 25 patients um, uh, 
patients um, uh, who were treated with um, uh, in the ICU without IVIG, and they noticed that uh, their survival improved 84% um, for those 21 patients compared to 60% in the non-IVIG group. Um, and uh, for this reason, um, it is reasonable to use IVIG if you have low ejection fraction. Uh, patients who have uh, cardiogenic shock arrhythmias and really uh, cannot uh, have have um, uh, cannot sustain their their um, uh, organ function uh, how, uh, should be placed on ECMO if you're in a center that does ECMO. Uh, sometimes we place them on LV assist device, uh, or if they are older, we use aortic balloon pump. Um, those uh, two are uh, a bridge for transplantation if their cardiac function does not recover um, in, in the next two weeks. So in summary, um, in so if someone presents with myocarditis or suspected myocarditis, you just have to remember your ABCs or CABs. Um, supportive therapy is the main therapy. Um, intubation will improve the cardiac output because it decreases the work of breathing and the, and the cardiac uh, work. However, we, you have to be very careful with intubation medications because those patients are sitting on the edge and they can arrest when you are intubating them. We use the minimal medication that caused a low SVR. Uh, avoid fluid overload, um, IVIG if left ventricular ejection fraction is low. Um, we diurese them, we buffer them with uh, sodium bicarb. Um, we use inotropic support with epinephrine or dopamine. Um, and if the blood pressure permits, we use a marinone as, um, uh, which is phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor. And um, it's an ino uh, inotrope with um, afterload reduction. Uh, we treat arrhythmias aggressively. And we use mechanical support if there's severe acidosis, arrhythmia, or low ejection fraction. Um, so to follow up on our case, our patient remained on ECMO for 20 days, had a somewhat recovery of her LV, and um, and she was um, uh, decannulated and then extubated with um, remaining LV ejection fraction uh, that improved over time. Currently, she has a mild to moderate LV ejection uh, LV dysfunction and remains on heart failure medication. Um, case number three. Um, um, uh, is a 17-year-old young male who presented with a five-day history of fever, vomiting, um, a tea-colored urine, uh, fatigue, myalgia, headaches, and left upper quadrant abdominal pain and loose stools. He uh, was seen in an outside hospital where his blood work showed only mild elevation of his white count with bands of 16% mild anemia and thrombocytopenia. His um, inflammatory markers were elevated. Um, his blood culture at 50 hours grew hemophilus per influenza. His CT scan, uh, the CT scan done because of abdominal pain and hepatosphenomegaly showed a splenic infarct. Um, so he was started on antibiotics and transferred to our institution. His review system is negative. On his physical examination, his precordium is quiet. He was kind of um, a, a big guy. Uh, so his cardiac exam um, showed a very soft grade 1 over 4 diastolic murmur at the right upper sternal border. But everything else was normal except um, this, uh, which was a splinter hemorrhage on his finger. Um, uh, for, uh, for this reason, and giving the constellation of his symptoms, we did an echocardiogram that showed a normal um, uh, cardiac structures with aortic valve vegetations and mild to moderate aortic insufficiency. Um, the aortic valve was not bicuspid. Um, the LV was um, uh, um, not dilated, and the LV systolic function was normal. So. Um, in, uh, uh, at this day, um, in um, developed countries, usually um, uh, the, inf uh, the um, in infective endocarditis is rare. It's um, a, a rheumatic heart disease in underdeveloped countries, the most common acquired heart disease, but in um, a, but it's very rare in, in in the developed countries. And, and infective endocarditis is more common than rheumatic heart disease. Usually, um, it, it is actually uh, seen in um, patients with congenital heart disease. 
um, especially that now we are we we do have more innovative and palliative surgical techniques um, such as the systemic to pulmonary shunts for cyanotic heart disease. Um, we have more prosthetic devices or material, but it is associated with high velocity jets. Um, uh, uh, like a small VSDs, PDAs, aortic stenosis, or aortic insufficiency. It's also seen in normal hearts with indwelling central venous catheters, especially neonates. Um, the pathogenesis of infective endocarditis is, is um, uh, interesting. There is um, a damage of the endothelium that um, uh, results from a, a turbulent flow. So the jet um, um, damages the endothelium, and um, there is a, um, a endothelium, uh, endothelium dysfunction that attracts fibrin and platelet, um, uh, which form uh, that form a thrombus. Um, this, the thrombus entraps a bacteria from stray bacteremia. We all have bacteremia in our body on a daily basis. So this stray bacteria um, initiates a focus of infection. The platelets and fibrin are deposited, forming vegetation. The most common organisms are streptococci, uh, then staph, then haystack, um, like Haemophilus actinobacillus, Echinella, Kingella. Um, it, it can be fungal, it can be gram-negative, and it can be culture-negative. Um, in culture-negative uh, infective endocarditis, we, um, um, we think that it can be because uh, those patients had uh, received uh, antibiotics um, uh, before the blood culture was done, or if, if they have uh, nutritionally deficient strains of streptococci, uh, either fungal or Q fever or chlamydia or Bartonella. The complications of infective endocarditis can be systemic. Um, typically, um, the heart is pumping, and with each beat, uh, there's vegetations um, that are going into the body. So there is, um, this can uh, cause uh, thromboembolic events like stroke uh, or mycotic aneurysms in the brain, uh, metastatic infection everywhere, uh, persistent bacteremia or fungemia. Um, uh, there is emboli of vegetation, and our immune response uh, stimulates um, a, a antigen antibody complex formation that deposits in the kidneys, causing nephritis um, in the um, in, 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 in the hands, causing ocular nodes in the uh, retina, uh, causing rust spots, and uh, causing rheumatoid factor. The um, uh, the uh, genway lesions uh, that we see here are embolic uh, skin um, uh, uh, phenomenon. Um, uh, um, I'm sorry, the splinter hemorrhages are embolic. Uh, this is complex immune um, uh, in the genway lesions. The ocular nodes are um, uh, seen, and um, the wool cotton. Um, uh, um, uh, um, and abnormalities that we see in the on the fundoscopic examination um, that is surrounded by some um, bleeding is is the rough spot. Um, <clears throat> the cardiac complications of uh, infective endocarditis can be uh, because of uh, obstruction um, uh, of the blood going through a valve or because this valve becomes incompetent, um, because the um, infection can um, uh, extend to the to the um, uh, conduction tissue. You can have heart block or arrhythmias. Um, uh, the uh, extension can um, extend into the um, uh, around the valve, causing perianular abscess or um, in the pericardium and cause pericardial effusion. Um, if it's a prosthetic valve, it can dehiss or obstruct or not function at all. Um, the, the cardiac manifestations are suspected or should be suspected if you have a new murmur or change in an old murmur, if you suddenly develop heart failure, which is the most important and common complications and that, uh, that uh, need surgery. Um, the heart failure can be acute um, and can be insidious, and usually the insidious heart failure is the most common in those patients. Um, so patients with infective endocarditis and heart failure should be immediately evaluated for possible surgical therapy, and ECHO helps in, in, in follow-up on those patients and see if they really need surgery or not. Um, 
Acute heart failure is more frequent uh, in aortic valve infections than mitral valve or tricuspid valve disease. It's usually poorly tolerated if caused by a, a aortic insufficiency, intermediately tolerated for mitral regurgitation, um, and this is why. Uh, if suddenly the um, aortic valve becomes insufficient, the blood comes back to the left ventricle. This left ventricle is stiff, and it's not used to the amount of blood that comes back to it, so it becomes sudden, it does not work. Um, there's sudden increase in left ventricular and diastolic uh, pressure, sudden increase in the left atrial pressure and pulmonary venous congestion, and pulmonary edema. So um, in, um, in, um, uh, as compared to acute mitral regurgitation, where when you have mitral regurgitation, the left atrium did not have a chance to really um, uh, uh, dilate and, and be compliant to the increase of the, the blood coming to it, um, so the, uh, the left atrial pressure is very high, and it translates into a high um, uh, uh, pulmonary venous pressure and, and, and pulmonary edema. Um, we use uh, the um, uh, modified U criteria to help uh, make the diagnosis, and this is uh, from uh, up to date. Uh, this is used. Um, this is um, this uses the pathologic criteria, uh, meaning you have to demonstrate microorganisms by culture or histologic examination, or um, of a vegetation or intracardiac abscess, or um, uh, uh, pathologic lesions um, uh, that you confirm by his histologic examination showing active endocarditis. Um, the, uh, it also relies on uh, positive blood cultures, um, more than two cultures uh, of a typical uh, uh, infective endocarditis organism or persistently positive culture uh, for at least 12 hours um, or um, uh, evidence of endocardial involvement, either positive echocardiogram or new valve regurgitation. There are um, a, so to make the diagnosis of definite definite endocarditis. You, um, I just mentioned the the major criteria. You also have minor criteria, and those are predisposition, um, pre predisposing heart condition, um, high fever, vascular phenomena like septic pulmonary infarct mycotic aneurysm, genital lesions, or immunologic phenomena like Osler nodes, rough spots, rheumatoid factors, um, with microbiologic uh, evidence of a positive blood culture um, that is not typical for IE, or um, uh, uh, period. Um, uh, so. To make the diagnosis of definite endocarditis, you have to have two major criteria, um, or one major and three minor, or three minor, uh, or five minor criteria. To uh, make the diagnosis of possible endocarditis, you have to have one major and uh, one minor, or three minor criterion. The management of infective endocarditis is usually supportive. Um, treatment of heart failure, antimicrobial therapy that is um, uh, that is uh, usually bactericidal, and the drug choice is based on the pathogen that is um, uh, um, uh, that you get from the culture. It's usually for a native valve is four to six weeks. Uh, for prostatic valve is more than six weeks. Um, surgery if if um, uh, um, surgery if patient is really an acute heart failure or um, there's obstruction or abscess, um, and you manage the complication of infective endocarditis. A few words, a few last words about the American Heart Association recommendation for endocarditis prophylaxis. In 2007, those recommendations changed and um, now are restricted to patients who would have the greatest morbidity if they were afflicted with uh, infective endocarditis. Um, um, it, uh, those include prosthetic cardiac valve. Uh, if someone had a previous infective endocarditis, uh, cardiac transplantation recipients who develop valvulopathy or uh, cyanotic uh, heart disease uh, that are either unrepaired or completely repaired, but they have prosthetic material or device either by surgery or catheter in six months post-procedure, or repaired congenital heart disease that have residual defects, um, either at the site or adjacent to the site of a prosthetic patch. 
um, we uh, limit those indications to those patients because um, our daily activities, such as um, brushing our teeth or flossing or um, stooling, um, uh, causes uh, stray bacteremia, but our immune system usually kills those bacteria. So, and we don't take antibiotic on a daily basis. So, uh, we deserve um, SPE prophylaxis for uh, quote unquote dirty procedure for this list. Uh, in summary, infective enterocarditis is rare but can be serious and fatal. Uh, it should be considered in every case of fever of unknown origin. Blood cultures are essential for the diagnosis. Um, echocardiogram is the best method to monitor and follow up uh, infective endocarditis, but a negative echo does not rule it out. Um, and antimicrobials are the main treatment. And um, it, congestive heart failure is the most common complication indication for surgery. So to follow up in our case, this patient was treated with um, uh, six weeks of antibiotics. He did not develop congestive heart failure until one month after his um, admission. And unfortunately, he had to have aortic valve replacement with a prosthetic valve due to severe um, aortic insufficiency that was not tolerated.